I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our panel, please. On the far right, that would be um, Tia Whitaker, Statewide Director, Outreach and Enrollment for the Pennsylvania Association of Community Health Centers. She serves as the lead navigator for health, health center-based in-reach, outreach, and enrollment. In the middle, we have David Buno. It's pretty good. Okay, close <laughs> enough. All right, good. Consumer liaison for the Pennsylvania Insurance Department. He supports the department's initiatives to keep the state's insurance market competitive while focusing on helping consumers consumers learn and understand their rights and responsibilities, what insurance product options are available to them, and provide a place for consumers to get answers to their questions. And then on the far left, Joe Tompkins, board member for Healthcare for All PA. It educates people on single payer and works to secure a true comprehensive universal health care system for every citizen of Pennsylvania. The mission is to educate you, the public, as well as our elected officials on why we need to improve upon our current health care system and support and encourage legislation. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. To begin our discussion this evening, I'd like to put forth our first question, please. From your perspective, can you provide a general impression or overview of PA health insurance as it is today? So as it is today, um, we've grown in leaps and bounds in Pennsylvania. Um, we have so many different offerings um, from our Medicaid program to our Medicare program to the health insurance marketplace to the children's health insurance program. Um, our Department of Insurance um, has done a wonderful job with regulating um, those specific programs and over the years we've seen that more and more people are getting educated on what's available um, and where they fit and what fits for them. So I know a lot of times we receive questions on, you know, you hear questions about the individual market uh, or the marketplace as to whether or not it is stable. Uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, it absolutely is stable. In all 67 counties, we continue to maintain the insurers. Uh, we've actually increased uh, two insurers over the last two years. So, you know, we have insurance companies coming into our marketplace, uh, as well as current insurers are expanding into uh, new counties. Uh, so this year, based on the filings, we have uh, one of our health insurers expanding into 14 new counties that they were not in before. Uh, and over 20 counties gained insurers in 2019. So there's a lot of good stuff going on here. Uh, in Crawford County specifically, there are 2,388 individuals currently signed up for plans on the marketplace. Does everybody know what the marketplace is? Okay, I see a lot of head shaking, yes. Uh, and in Pennsylvania, there are about 400,000 Pennsylvanians signed up for plans on the marketplace. So Pennsylvania is a, a good place to be. Insurance companies are coming into the state, uh, and we continue to do what we can to make the marketplace competitive and also monitor the rates to see how we can make health insurance more affordable for all. Um. So I might be coming from a slightly different perspective. I'm not a policy expert. I'm not involved in the healthcare field or the healthcare industry. I'm an academic, and um, I'm also a board member of this organization, uh, Healthcare for All PA. We're basically an advocacy group, uh, an educational advocacy group, and we're advocating on behalf of a state single payer system. So from I think from that perspective, from this perspective of an entirely different kind of insurance system, a different way of doing health insurance, which would be a single payer system. I mean, I would consider the current state of health care in Pennsylvania kind of reflective. I mean, I can't speak to the details, mm -hmm. and it's not to dismiss any of the progress that's been made in the state, but I think just generally speaking, our national health care system, like our state health care system, is a total disaster. If you consider the fact that, you know, it's the highest cause of bankruptcy, 66% of bankruptcy filings are for people who can't afford their medical bills. 
40% uh, of people, 40% of Americans don't have enough to cover a $1,000 medical emergency. We've got about 30 million uninsured people in the country. About 82 million are underinsured, meaning they forego coverage because they're worried they won't be able to afford it. Uh, I was just speaking with a student today, because I, I don't necessarily teach about healthcare policy or the industry, but I actually teach about corporate propaganda, the history of corporate propaganda, and there's been no shortage of propaganda around the issue of healthcare. Uh, I was speaking to a student recently, because I teach at Allegheny College in Meadville, uh, a student who's, uh, whose mother recently lost her job. She was in retail. She was laid off. Her COBRA ran out. She uh, pulled a, uh, she, what was it in your back? If you, you know, slipped a disc in her back. Uh, the medical bills were running up and she actually had to take, the student had to take a couple weeks off of class to kind of go back and help the family regroup. They're even worried about bankruptcy. That's here in Pennsylvania. Just somebody like that. I mean, this is part of our precarious system. There's there's definitely services available, I'd say, if you're you know, on the really low end. And I think uh, my co-panelists up here could probably speak more to the specifics of this. Uh, but if you're kind of stuck in the middle, if you've got employer-based insurance, if you lose your job, you're kind of stuck, right? Um, you might find yourself facing increasing deductibles, increasing co-pays. In other words, crummier plans, even as healthcare gets more and more expensive. So from the perspective of, an, of another possibility, a single-payer system, I would consider our current system a failure. And with that, I would encourage our audience to ask questions. If you have anything uh, that you'd like to inquire of the panel, please just raise your hand and I'll be happy to um, give you the microphone. Moving on with our second question. What does it mean to go from the federal insurance marketplace to state-based insurance, what are the benefits and potential criticisms of that decision? So the benefits, there, there are quite a few. Um, for years, the state of Pennsylvania has been dependent on the federal system uh, in regards to uh, navigator funding in regards to education, in regards to what plans are here, how the plans are here and review. The insurance department shares in the responsibility when it comes into reviewing the plans, reviewing the rates, but this will give us a little bit more uh, opportunity to kind of make uh, Pennsylvania uh, its own state. Uh, we will be able to use some of the savings from transferring to a state-based exchange. Right now, about $88 million goes to the federal government uh, for plans that are on the exchange. So the insurers pay a little tax, the tax goes to them. That money would actually come to the state. And the state would be able to, one of the things that we're working on right now is moving to a reinsurance program. Has anybody ever heard of reinsurance? No? Reinsurance is pretty much uh, insurance for insurance. So what this program will allow us to do is take those really high cost health care bills off and that the reinsurance would start to take care of that, which should ultimately bring down rates for everybody here. Does that make sense? So you take those high risk away or off the plate, and then when the insurers are looking at uh, rates and we're approving rates, we would take those off, which means rates should need to be lower. So it's one way that can we, we can actually start to contain some of the cost uh, that you were speaking about. Um, it, it's going to allow us to directly handle consumer complaints and better address consumer issues. It's going to give us data on a lot of the uninsured populations that we don't have right now. Uh, when I am trying to figure out where folks that are uninsured are, I have to depend on multiple different things like the U.S. Census and, and other reports that are out there and kind of make educated guesses where now we will have the information at our fingertips. Uh, that will let us have more ability to conduct a more impactful outreach. You know, right now, you know, this year we're going to go to 17 different libraries throughout the state trying to get the open enrollment campaign. When you actually have the data, you will really know where to go to and how to go to it. We're going to have the ability to analyze enrollment data 
which we do not have right now. So we'll really understand what plans folks have, where education needs to be, and how to improve education. Um, and we're going to be able to define more special enrollment periods. Does anybody know what a special enrollment period is? What happens is with health insurance on the individual marketplace, you can sign up from November 1st through December 15th. Throughout the year, certain life changes could happen that may qualify you for to enroll. Uh, so a lot of folks don't know that they can do that. They just think they lost their window, but if they lose their job, uh, they may qualify for a special enrollment period. And at that point, they can get into contact with a navigator. And the navigator can walk through and determine if those individuals would be Medicaid eligible, which you're Medicaid eligible all the time. Right. Or if you would qualify for an ACA open enrollment, and if it's someone that would be unemployed, there's a possibility that they would qualify for subsidies that would help pay for their health insurance. About 80 to 85% of Pennsylvanians receive financial assistance from the ACA and the ACA plan. So, you know, while we are very aware, and one of the things that keeps the commissioner up at night uh, are the folks that I wouldn't say are in the middle, but are at that beyond the subsidy range mm -hmm. right. uh, and the affordability of health insurance for those folks. We, we are very concerned about those. Uh, individuals, but once again, having a state-based exchange will hopefully allow us the ability to address some of the challenges that we don't have. One final thing uh, that it'll help us with is, uh, over the past couple years, the federal government has been uh, creating challenges uh, when it comes to health insurance for whatever reasons. You know, we, there, there are a bunch of reasons. And with health, with health insurance and all insurance, it's predicting the future. So if you're trying to predict the future and there's constant instability, insurance companies are going to err on the side of safety versus err on the side of, of, of taking that really big risk. And what that means is that creates increases in health insurance rates. You know, when they don't know what's going to happen, or when the federal government says they're not going to reimburse something that's said that it's going to be reimbursed, uh, the insurance companies have to make adjustments. With it coming to a state-based exchange, we'll be able to control those things uh, a little bit more, too. Uh, and, and that has been a challenge. That's why the insurance department has become uh, a lot more uh, involved when it comes to navigators, when it comes to enrollment, when it comes to education, because unfortunately the federal government has, has, has not done those things. So, so that's some of the benefits of the state-based exchange. Tio, do you have anything? So with the question, uh, the benefits, um, federally qualified health centers um, across the state are equipped with navigators and certified application counselors to assist consumers throughout the insurance continuum, whether they have insurance or whether they don't or whether they're in between. So while we are operating in a system that may not be what we seem to be the best, um, navigators and certified application counselors in health centers are the experts at making sure that those who are coming in get the coverage that they need. Like I said earlier, whether it's through Medicaid, um, medical assistance, or whether it's Medicare, or the health insurance marketplace, or the children's health insurance program. So when you meet with a navigator, you're able to sit down and say, this is what's happening. How can you help me? And I believe, because that's what I do every day, meeting with folks and assisting them and having that knowledge, the information that we get from the Department of Insurance and meeting with consumers, getting them what they need, that's what this is really about. Um, health insurance navigators, we are certified. We're registered with the Department of Insurance. We work with folks every single day. We make sure that we're qualified. <laughs> we make sure we have the latest and greatest information. So like I said, while there are some things we would like to change, uh, we're working with what we have and we're making sure that the folks that we meet with get the care and the insurance that they need. The, the, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this is for David. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, you talked about the challenges that the federal government uh, was challenging health care kind of mm -hmm. for different reasons. Sure. 
Um, and so now the state has taken over the marketplace. Um, are those same challenges, those same threats, I mean like, is it the General Assembly that's going to determine if the marketplace in Pennsylvania continues? Or, you know, are those threats totally gone that the healthcare system as it is now in the marketplace is going to be tampered with? You know, I guess I want to know what the protections are, permanent protections mm -hmm. that we would never be threatened again. Because I have a personal story. When I retired, I had to determine if I was to continue my employer-based expensive health insurance or to go on to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. I wanted to try and go on to the marketplace to see if it was more affordable sure. for me. But with the threat, like you were talking about, the, of the challenges that the federal government was throwing out there, I had to stay with my expensive health care plan through my employer when I retired. So for someone like me, I'm a little bit leery because I do have good health care, though it costs me through the nose. Mm -hmm. But if I was to go on to the state marketplace, what would be the, the threat? Would I be facing the same threats eventually if a new governor, legislators, which are going to happen, you're going to have turnover of legislators, sure. um, what are the challenges through the state? Well, great question. The couple of things that I want to make sure that you all know about is that the state-based exchange uh, passed on a unanimous bipartisan, with, by, with unanimous bipartisan support. Uh, so both Republicans and Democrats came together and unanimously supported the state-based exchange. Uh, in regards to a state-based exchange and a marketplace, they, you know, there are still challenges that exist even though we transition to a state-based exchange that at the federal level uh, the, the removal of the ACA could potentially right. impact a state-based exchange. What, what we have control over is, as, as an insurance department, is regulating the laws that exist today. And it's always a challenge because, you know, when, when I hear Joe it, 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 folks ask, what do you think about the, the universal, you know, it, it's hard for us because our job is to regulate the laws that exist. Right. That, that's our role. Uh, so, you know, to, so to answer your question, the AC, while we are going to a state-based exchange, there are still ways that the federal government can impact even the state-based exchanges. And if that ACA uh, goes away, it could still impact a state-based exchange. So it doesn't necessarily take it and put it on the Pennsylvania legislature, even though uh, w with bipartisan support, I, I think the Republicans and Democrats in the state of Pennsylvania looked at it going, you know what, this is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And and I, you know, and, and anytime you get a bipartisan, bipartisan support, it's it's an amazing thing, especially in the environment that we all seem to be in at the, at the, at the federal level and at any level. Um, so I, I hope I answered your, your question. Now, in regards to what I would do if, if I were in your shoes, is I would talk to someone like Tia and her organization. Uh, because as of right now, uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen with the ACA. The state-based exchange doesn't go into place until uh, 2021. So right now we are in the process of a transition, which is a state-based exchange uh, FP. On a federal platform. Federal platform level. So that'll be this year, the 2020 plan year. So, so right now we're in the process of the state-based exchange actually being formed. Uh, so it isn't here yet. So I guess with that, if, if you look into it, contact the navigators that are, that are in the room, I would absolutely look to see what is available what potential savings you, you can have because, you know, I, I don't know where it'll be in the future. That, that honestly is the threat. Yeah. Why I would never do it. I would just stay with my expensive employer-based Yeah. until we get a national health care. Yeah. It, it, I think it, the... When it comes to health care, uh, I can only hope that 
uh, at some folks, at some point, folks start working together to try to figure out how to to do what's best for everybody. So. Yeah. And in the meantime, we need more people like Tia. I've been involved just locally and back in Meadville and in Crawford County helping people to get on the what has been the federal marketplace <laughs> to try to work their way into the Affordable Care System, Affordable Care Act system. Uh, and it's, I'll just tell you, it's a nightmare. I'm a media studies professor. I'm supposed to know how digital media works. I go on their website. I'm trying to help people enroll in the bronze plan or the silver plan or whatever. And it is an absolute nightmare. Yeah. So as long as the system as it exists, mm -hmm. exists, it'd be, it's great to have more people there who are experts and can guide people through the process and answer these kinds of questions. But again, I think we're already kind of teasing out some of the limitations that are inherent to this particular system right now. And so it's kind of, I guess, people like Tia and the navigators and social workers and all sorts of people to kind of fill in the gaps and plug in the holes where they exist. It's not just the uncertainty of the coverage, but also of the care. Um, we run into people all the time who say, well, I don't have health insurance, so I'm just not going to go see a doctor. Well, our federally qualified health centers across the state, there are 48 um, health centers in over 300 sites, and they meet with patients regardless of their ability to pay, so whether they're insured or they're not insured. They can go to a federally qualified health center and still get care. Could you explain a little bit more about um, the reinsurance population? If you belong in that population, yeah. what does that what does that change for yeah. you then? If you're kind of taken out of that block, that's a fantastic question. Absolutely nothing. You'll never even know. Uh, it is done not at an individual level, like like I explained, like that. It is. It's taking those larger losses that are over here out of the mix. But the individual is not impacted. They do not change plans. They don't go someplace else. They're not put in some kind of high risk pool, nothing like that. It's, it's just adjusting. It's taking the risk away from one place and moving it to another place. And by moving that risk over here, it allows the insurance companies to offer the better rate over here. So that is a great question. Thank you so much for asking for clarification on that. had some questions. You said it's still forming, mm -hmm. the, the, that, it, that there's no um, plan yet. You, we, they voted to go, s yeah. go state. The mm -hmm. state's going to dictate. Yes. So where can we or where, where can we find out information as it's developing? And if we, if we want to contribute or have, have ideas on how that should sure. go, where, where can we go? Our website at www.insurance.pa.gov, when you click on that, it's going to be three columns. The one, I'm, I'm facing you all, so I'm going to get this wrong. The one that's on my left, on your right, very top, there's actually a state-based exchange uh, button. And you click on that, and it tells you where we are in the process. Coming up in the very near future, we're going to be looking at what is called a 1332 waiver, which is for the reinsurance program. And we will be asking for public comment on that. So that will be coming up within the next month month or two. I, I, I don't know the exact dates yet. So if you, if you check on the, that uh, state-based exchange page, you'll see where we are, where you can comment, and different things that you can do to be part. Will you be promoting that? Um, uh, or is it just something, is there going to be something you're going to promote statewide so that people know that they have that opportunity? The public, oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely, okay. yeah. Uh, right now, we're working through what exactly that, how exactly, what it looks like, how it looks like, you know, is it, is it public, you know, coming out here, meeting you all, you know, if we do that, how many do you do, is there a way to use technology today, like Skype, where more folks can, can join in that, that maybe you can't get to, uh, is it a combination, you know, we're just trying to think through what are all the ways to get comment, but we are going to communicate it, we want the public comment, and, you know, so that we can make sure that we're doing things the way that they should be done for the public. Thank you. I have a couple more questions. <laughs> sure. Um, one, since you are developing yeah. currently, um, and I know that we just recently, um, we have a Pennsylvania dental director mm -hmm. who's recently appointed. Are there any plans for for your two um, departments to co collaborate? And because uh, I know I think they're 
revamping yeah. what, what the dental health issue looks like. And since it, you know, it seems to be part of the body, yeah. <laughs> we wondered, I wondered if, if there were any plans to collaborate in a more meaningful way relative to all insurance, not just um, some insurance. Sure. Now, one thing that I'd be willing to do, what's going to happen is the state-based exchange is not going to be part of the insurance department. It's going to be its own separate entity. You know, the reason for that uh, is do you want the person that's regulating it doing all that? Also, you know, you want to keep things separated. Uh, so what, what if you wouldn't mind, if you, you have my email information, correct? Email me the information you have, and I'll get it to the state-based exchange folks that are currently in place to let them know the question that you have and to see how that can be worked out. I don't know all the answers when it comes to state-based exchange because it is going to be two separate uh, entities. They're not going to be uh, connected. Paula's question reminded me, for those of us who are hard of hearing, uh -huh. Is there any hope for um, insurance to help pay for hearing aids, which are extremely expensive and not covered under most health insurance plans now? That is something that I'd be happy to talk to the folks at the state-based exchange about. I, I don't know the answer, but I'd be happy to look into that for you. And you know, one of the big challenges that we have uh, as well is when it comes to regulating health insurance, uh, a lot of folks will talk to us about, hey, my employer plan did this. And unfortunately, we don't regulate most of the, insure, uh, the employer plans. The United States Department of Labor does. Or somebody might say, hey, my Medicaid isn't treating me properly. We don't regulate Medicaid. The Department of Human Services does. Medicare is causing me a challenge. Well, that's the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services at, in Washington, D.C. You know, so uh, CHIP, that's DHS as well. So, there, you know, so when it comes to educating for, for <laughs> us, you know, when you mention hearing aids with the insurer, sometimes I want to go, okay, are we talking about the employer plans? We're we talking about marketplace plans. We talk, you know, because it's different ways to kind of get different things done, and that's a challenge. Uh, but we are working not only uh, with building relationships with community, with educating, but also taking these back and building relationships with the Department of Labor and building relationships with uh, DHS, which we already have because it's the state of Pennsylvania. But, you know, building those relationships, so as you bring those questions, not only will I bring it to the state-based exchange, but you also send it out to the Department of Labor so that they know that the community is asking these questions. So, you know. Uh, in, 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 sh in short, if you ever have a problem with insurance, you can still reach out to us, especially when it comes to health insurance, but just know that we may have to get others involved. Yeah. Well, those, those entities, DHS and Department of Labor, are they all at the table while you're developing the, the, what it's going to look like? What? In regards to Medicaid and Medicare, it would be treated like it is today with the marketplace. So that relationship, you know, while, while the relationships that we currently have with DHS within the state of Pennsylvania, I'm talking about Department of Human Services, PA, that I'm sure is far different than what the federal government has with the Department of Human Services, PA. So that is going to adjust and change, but we're gonna have those relationships as well. I, I think it'll be, no disrespect to the federal government, I think because we're PA, it'll be a better relationship because we're PA. David had spoke to the uncertainty of the future of health care. Perhaps the panelists could um, elaborate on where would you like to see health care going in the future? Well, I, could, I could handle this one. <laughs> Um, so how many people actually know what single payer health care is? I'm, my sense is because a lot of I saw a lot of you in the lobby. I'm assuming you're involved or at least familiar with the issues, but maybe not. I'm just curious. How many people are familiar with single payer? And know what that is? So not too many actually. Single payer is essentially to say that there would be one health insurer. Right? So single payer right now we've got, I mean, maybe you all could fill me in as far as how many insurance options there are, insurance companies in Pennsylvania. I know nationwide it's about 6,000 different insurance companies. So that's a multi-payer system. Insurance means this is the group, this is the agency that pays for your health care. 
right? That's how our current system works. So you buy insurance, they then pay the health care, they pay your provider, and they're kind of, they negotiate between the two. A single payer system would be to say, you would have a public entity, like say the state government of Pennsylvania, or the national government, the federal government of the United States, would provide health insurance for every single person. So you'd have one payer, a single payer of health care. There's a bunch of advantages that come with this. One would be to kind of mitigate all the complexity that's kind of coming out in this discussion, right? The difference between the Medicaid, the Medicare, the employer-based systems, all the, you know, the private, the commercial plans that you can buy. I mean, all that would virtually be eliminated because there would just be, again, one single payer of health care. Um, the group that I advocate for, or that I'm here representing anyway, is Healthcare for All PA. So what we're doing is we are, there are two, well there have been a series of bills proposed in the General Assembly to try to do this at the state level. To say, okay, we're not going to wait for the federal government to do it, let's try and have the state do it. We're not alone. I think there's upwards of the 30 states in the United States have put forth a single payer, a state-wide single payer proposal or single payer bill. Most of them have gone nowhere, uh, mostly for political reasons. I mean, this is essentially a question of class interests and there's a lot of money at stake. But if you come back to just the, the basics of what a single payer system can do, um, I think you could think about it in both a pragmatic sense, what it could give you, and there's also a moral argument to be made. The moral argument is pretty clear. It's just a question of, you may hear people talk about, is health care a right? We are the only country in the world that doesn't treat health care as a right. Every other country, at least every other industrialized country, provides universal health care. They provide quality care for their citizens. The United States doesn't do that. Uh, so th that's the moral thing. Do you think people should go bankrupt if they can't afford their medical bills? Do you think people should have to go through and wade through all these complex plans if they lose their job? Should their insurance be pinned to their job, right? Or should we just try to come up with a system that makes sure that everybody has access to decent health care? Uh, the practical side of this would be, I mean, most people are actually interested in things like the cost. What's it going to cost? And again, there's a lot of... I would just call it propaganda, not in a pejorative sense, but in a kind of descriptive sense. There's a lot of misleading information about what a single payer system would entail at the level of cost. I'll just give you a couple of numbers and kind of put it up against the, uh, the state level single payer system that Healthcare for All is advocating. So the bills that have been introduced in Pennsylvania are essentially trying to implement what's called a health care, what is it, health care plan, the Pennsylvania health care plan. Uh, in this plan, I mean, it's fairly simple uh, in terms of, you know, how you would actually fund it. The, the, propo the funding would basically come from two places. One would be a personal income tax on everybody. That would be 3% of your income. Uh, the other cost would be about 10% payroll on every business. So 10%, every, every business in Pennsylvania would have to devote 10% of their payroll that would go towards this trust that would then fund the single payer system. So that sounds like, if you just take it at face level, that's like, okay, so more taxes, more costs. The important thing to remember about single payer is it essentially, this is the only cost would be, say, your 3% personal income tax. You would pay no more deductibles, no more premiums, no more co-pays, no more hidden costs. All that goes away. And I would add that it also, at least the bills that have been proposed, would cover things like dental, they'd cover things like hearing aids, they'd cover things like eye care, right? So they provide expanded coverage, and it would actually be cheaper. Right now, nationally, uh, the average cost per capita, or per individual, in the United States, per individual, we spend $10,000 on health care every year. That's per individual. That's almost twice as much as any other country. The next closest country is Switzerland. They spend $5,800 per individual, right? That, the way that translates in terms of what I just mentioned about the Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania health care plan, that 3% personal income tax that you would pay, so 3% of your income. Right now, just taking the national average at $10,000 a year, so if you make $50,000, right, that is 20% of your income. Is that my math, my math right on that one? 20% of your income. If you, if you make $100,000 a year and you pay $10,000 towards your health care, that's 10% of your income. 
The single payer plan in Pennsylvania requires everybody to pay 3% of their income. Right, so massive savings at the individual level. In terms of employer costs, right now, the current average cost per employee in the United States, so the, cur the average cost that businesses spend for every employee that they provide health benefits, $14,800. That's about $6,000 per individual. And then if their individual employees have a family and they cover in a family plan, that's $18,500. So the National Small Business Association says that employers spend on average 13% of their payroll towards health benefits. Again, this, the Pennsylvania single payer plan would require businesses to pay 10% of their payroll. According to Forbes, just so you know, I'm not like, I mean, I'm on the left side of the panel, but I'm not always just <laughs> quoting left sources, I guess. And even this is a kind of nonpartisan thing. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt was the first one to talk about national health care. Um, Forbes, according to Forbes, U.S. businesses spend $880 billion a year on health care benefits. That means, I mean, they're spending that, and this is part of the uncertainty then, too. If you're a business owner, and the uncertainty about are my health care costs going to continue to rise for my employees, they've actually risen 76%. Businesses have, the, the business cost of providing health care benefits to employees has risen 76% since 2006. Right? They're now at historic, historic levels. Uh, I'll give you one more kind of perspective on this. Municipalities, right? Uh, cities, counties, they are also employers, so they'd be paying that 10% premium. But I'll just tell you, uh, there's still more savings there. Most in municipalities at this point pay on average 20% of their payroll towards health benefits for municipal employees, county employees, government employees. Crawford County pays, devotes 24.7% of its payroll towards health benefits. In 2018, it paid, its payroll was $26 million. And of that, it paid 6.4 million towards health care benefits. Under the healthcare, healthcare, the Pennsylvania health care plan, that would drop, so the expense would drop from $6.4 million to $2.6 million. So essentially that would save county taxpayers $3.8 million. So not only would it save you individually in terms of your own personal costs towards health care, it would also save you in terms of the taxes that you would pay to your municipality, to your school district, to your county. So there again, there's an economic argument here, but I actually think the moral argument is more important. I kind of feel like, you know, this ultimately is going to decide what kind of system do we want. Do we want a society where we, which we continue to have, where costs continue to go up, healthcare becomes more and more affordable as coverage becomes thinner and thinner, all these gaps, or do we want to try to do something else? Single payer system would be one way to do that at the state level or at the national level. Mm -hmm. So, risk. Who wants to carry the risk? We all end up carrying the risk for folks who are um, going to the ER who are uninsured. Um, they may not have the ability to pay, but there's a cost. So the hospitals then take on that risk, and then they have to share that risk in order to stay viable and stay open. So it's not... From my perspective, it's not just about what works and what doesn't work, it's the system that we have now. So we have to work individually and collectively to make the system that we have now better. And everyone comes from their individual perspective. But again, it comes down to risk. Who wants to carry the risk? Who wants to share the burden? We all have to. So for those of us who are working with federally qualified health centers, we see folks come in all the time. Um, we give them information, we provide them with health care. Um, they're able to see a primary care physician, they're able to see um, a dentist, they're able to get behavioral health services. And those services are mainly provided by the federal government because they're federally qualified health centers. So we want to make sure that we're getting education out to the consumers and to patients. Come and utilize these services, they're here for you. We also talk to them about preventative services and taking preventative measures. You shouldn't be smoking 10 packs a day. You know, you, you should be careful about what you're eating. Be careful about what you're drinking. So there are several layers to this. 
But I step back and I look and I say, risk is the key. Who wants to take on the risk? We all have to. You know, um, two months ago, I was here in Titusville. And I met a, a young guy who was working at McDonald's. Uh, I believe he was making seven fifty an hour. And he was uninsured. Uh, and he needed medications. You know, it wasn't uh, like he was that guy that just chose not to be uninsured. He was somebody that needed insurance. You know, as I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest challenges that, that we have as regulators is we regulate the laws that exist. One of my big concerns are the folks like that guy that worked at McDonald's, that wasn't getting health care, that was absolutely available to him, that he wasn't taking advantage of. Uh, so, so, you know, for me, uh, you know, we want to do everything that we can to make available comprehensive health insurance plans that are affordable. We want to be sure that we work with our partners. You know, when, when folks have, you know, big ideas, good ideas, you know, uh, and, but make sure that we don't lose sight of all the folks that can actually be getting help right now with what, what's available to them. Because the things that you're working on will take time. It, it, it will. Um, you know, we are going to continue to take feedback, provide feedback. We would speak to the state senator, speak to the representative when they send us, okay, this is what we have. What are the thoughts? What are the pros? What are the cons? You know, we want to make sure that we're always part of that. But I, but I do worry, uh, you know, when I, when I met that, that young guy, that here he was without insurance, and there just wasn't a reason for him to be uninsured. So, you know, while we're working on... Uh, the fixing of opportunities. I don't want to forget about the people that, that really need us to communicate and yeah, get help. Right now. Thank you. What challenges challenges do you see with the current health insurance system? Uh, could you mind if I go for it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, if an individual is not receiving assistance, uh, a challenge I see is cost. It, it's, it's expensive. Um, you know, with that said, as I mentioned earlier, 80% of Pennsylvanians do receive some type of assistance on the marketplace, and, and subsidies are available, and pe folks, if they can take advantage of them, should take advantage of them. Um, charges like deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, those are things that I see as current challenges to our, our health system. And what you pay for your monthly premium, you know. So you know. So those are the things that I see as a regulator when you're looking at the plans that are available and and looking at the things. And I think you do you see the same type of challenges. Um, I would. I'm going to answer a bit differently. Sure, go for I it. I would agree with those yeah. as challenges. Yeah. Again, I'm um, just. I mean, I appreciate what both of you are saying, and I agree entirely with what you're saying as far as the system that we have mm -hmm. now. There's more work we can do, especially to get people who you know, have access to care and they're maybe not taking advantage of it. But again, coming from the perspective of an, another possible way of doing it, I mean, the reason, I'm, and this is not, maybe there might be a slight disagreement, if at all, here. I don't know that it's just a question of us coming together in this common way, because I do think this is a political issue. And by that, I mean that there's a lot of money at stake. Uh, there's a reason why we're the only country in the world that doesn't have a universal health care system. And that's because we've got, there is a, I mean, my short answer to the question of what are the obstacles would be money, the power of money, and misinformation. And the power of money includes the fact that the top, I mean, does anybody want to guess who the top lobbyists are these days in Washington? The industries, the top industries that are lobbying our politicians? Anybody want to take a guess? Hmm? Pharmaceutical is the number one industry. Um, what I'll just get my, so I get the numbers right. In 2018, the pharmaceutical industry spent 283 million dollars lobbying United States politicians. Since 1998, they've spent 4.2 billion dollars lobbying Congress, um, basically to keep the status quo. And that would include something like so to to to. Make sure something like single payer doesn't happen. The reason pharmaceuticals wouldn't want single payer is because it would allow, whether it's the Pennsylvania state government or even bigger, the federal government, to negotiate drug prices. 
Maybe you've heard about the fact that we pay more for prescription drugs than any other country. The reason is because it's written into the laws that you know uh, pharmaceutical companies don't have to face competition against generics, and they're in, and then. And when Medicare, they tried to, in Medicare in 2007, they tried to say, well, Medicare could negotiate for, on the country could negotiate drug prices. The pharmaceuticals pushed against it. They lobbied hard against it, so that doesn't happen. So the result is that drug prices go up. So they're the biggest lobbying firm. This, anybody want to guess the second biggest lobbying industry in Washington? Insurance. Yep, insurance is number two. Pharmaceuticals, number one. Insurance, number two. Insurance spent $158 million last year lobbying Congress. So that's what I mean. The power of money is the biggest obstacle to something like a single-payer system or a universal system, right? It's not necessarily the fact that we can't come together and agree on it. If you do the polls, I mean, depending on the, the most conservative polls will show. I mean, there was the big, was it the Reuters poll that showed 73% of Americans are in favor of Medicare for all, which would be a national single payer system. But even the most conservative polls show that 53% of the population, generally speaking, is in favor of Medicare for all national single payer. It's like 84% of Democrats. You may hear that, you know, once they say that, okay, you'll lose your private insurer, uh, you'll lose your insurance company, then the numbers go down. But then once you explain to people what single payer is, the numbers go way back up. And it's actually among Democrats that the numbers go down. General population, they stay the same. But the point is, the population is in favor of a single payer system. That's what the majority of people want. Why don't we have it? Because our politicians are more conservative than we are because they are pressured by the lobbying firms. I believe that the original plan was to invite Kathy, Kathy Rapp, right, who's, the, who's a Republican House member. I think she, she probably serves Titusville. She's not in my district. My district is Brad Rowe, who you know, is just conservative. But she's, is she the chair of the Health Committee at the General Assembly? She's not here. She doesn't care, right? If she cared, she'd be here. Uh, Michelle Brooks, she was invited. She's not here either. Right? So this is a question of our politicians basically not doing what the population wants. The population wants a better health care system, and they're not giving it to us. It's a long-winded answer, but the second, if I could say, speak a little bit to the misinformation part, too. Uh, you know, where, so these, these pharmaceutical industries, the health care industries, the health insurance companies, they spend a lot not just on lobbying, they spend a lot on misinformation. You may have, if you guys maybe watched the Democratic debates that have been going on when there was 20 candidates back during that debate, there was actually an advertisement during the debate sponsored by ph the pharmaceutical industry spreading misinformation about health care for all. Because Bernie Sanders was there, Elizabeth Warren was there, people were proposing Medicare for all. And then you've got commercials funded by the pharmaceuticals and the health care industry saying, this is bad stuff. If you get Bernie Sanders elected, he does this Medicare for all, bad things are going to happen. One of the biggest supporters of Pennsylvania's health care plan is a guy named Wendell Potter. I'm not sure if people have heard about Wendell Potter. He's a former health care executive who's now an advocate of, of single payer. But he also has written a lot about the kind of misinformation, or call it propaganda if you want, that's out there around uh, health care and health insurance. <clears throat> so he talks about what he calls the FUD principle. It's an acronym. He says, within the healthcare industry, he was, again, a former health insurance executive. His job, as he saw it during that time, was to spread misinformation along the lines of FUD, and FUD stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Right? So they have people whose sole job it is to spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt about something like a single-payer system. Right? And they spend millions of dollars every year to spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt. His talking points, he's again, he's written on this. You could search Wendell Potter and find this information. But he talks about these, the main talking points around something like Medicare for All, the way to spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You say, we can't afford it, right, without getting into the cost of the current system and how that's increasingly unaffordable. Say, Medicare for All will be too disruptive. We've already kind of gotten a sense of how the current system is highly disruptive. If you lose your job, you know, uh, do, I go with the, do I go with the state marketplace? What's that going to look like? Is it going to cover this? I mean, it's already disruptive. Is my insurance going to co uh, cover, am I in network? Am I out of network? <clears throat> Hospitals will go bankrupt. 
That's another big talking point. Uh, Wendell Potter's response is, uh, he says, actually under a single payer system, hospitals would be paid in lump sums and it would cover operating costs, payments would be negotiated. Another talking point, medical for all, Medicare for all will limit choice. I mean, it's technically true, you wouldn't have any more choice when it came to private insurance. You'd have to go with a single payer system. But you would certainly have choice when it came to choosing your doctor, choosing what hospital you wanted to go to. Again, right now, the current system limits your choice. Certain doctors are in network, certain hospitals are in network, certain doctors and hospitals are out of network. That is the current private insurance industry regulating, or you could call it rationing, your choices, limiting your choices. And the Americans who have employer-sponsored insurance love it. That's another talking point. People who have their insurance right now love it. Uh, I'd be interested to do a kind of a, <laughs> a poll to see if people actually really love their health care at this point. I won't do it, but I mean, I have health care through the college where I work at. I don't love it. My deductibles continue to go up. My coverage gets thinner and thinner every year. I get these costs that kind of sneak up. I go in for a procedure. I'm expecting just to pay my base. I, once I've reached my deductible, if there's a copay, get a hidden cost of a couple thousand dollars. I had a dermatology appointment just a couple months ago where that happened, just a routine checkup, and all of a sudden I'm getting a bill for $3,500, right? So all of these talking points, this is something, again, that the industry is out there. The people who have a vested interest in the status quo spend millions of dollars to make sure we, we are afraid, uncertain, and doubtful about any kind of change to the healthcare system. And that's, th those are the biggest obstacles, the power of money and the power of misinformation. <clears throat> the wonderful part um, that I've seen and that I know personally is that uh, navigators and certified application counselors um, have a complete and total understanding of all of the programs. They understand the circumstances that folks are bringing to them, um, have the ability to direct them the right way, to get the best kind of coverage for them, provide them with options, and give them information. Um, the folks who are at community health centers, we give unbiased, free information. Like I said earlier, we're trained. Um, we have an understanding. We all know the healthcare system is very complex and at times can be convoluted. But I've sat with consumers, um, just as recent as last week, who came in and said, listen, I don't know what I'm doing. And I said, well, I know <laughs> what you can do and what's available to you. So um, for me, it's challenging when there aren't enough folks on the ground like me to assist consumers and help them walk through the process. That's one of the challenges that I see all the time. Um, I'm meeting with consumers. There's only so many hours in a day. There's only so many days in a week that I can sit down and talk to consumers and walk them through the process and give them the options and say, listen, here's what you can choose from. This is what's available. When you have a question, call me. I get phone calls all the time, and I know Lisa <laughs> is all over the place <laughs> in this section of the state. Uh, she's a health insurance navigator with Meatville. And she gets all kinds of questions and all kinds of calls. And people are just confused. They don't know. They don't understand. But that's what we're here to do. We're on the ground. We're talking to folks. We're walking them through the process. And uh, Joe had mentioned about the surprise balance bill uh, that you received. Uh, that is one thing that we are watching. And that is one thing that if you do receive something like that, don't be afraid to file a complaint with us because we're trying to uh, make sure that we address that appropriately. And that's the situation where you, you go and have a procedure and then all of a sudden you find out, oh, the anesthesiologist isn't in the network, but I went to the hospital, I went to the doctor, I went to everybody in my network. Why am I being surprised with this balance bill? So definitely let us know uh, about that it, it, you know, so that we can kind of address that. You can file complaints with the insurance department. Uh, the only way that I can guarantee you that we can help us if we know, because unfortunately, we, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, we do do market conduct exams on insurance companies, all the insurance companies, but they come over time. So unless folks are letting us know about opportunities that exist or problems that they're having, 
we, we can't do anything about it. So make sure to spread the word that we do exist. We do take complaints. You can file those complaints with us. And even if it is a, if it's with the Department of Labor, we just don't go, sorry, <laughs> that's their problem. No, we, we direct it to where it needs to go. Um, so. Is there, um, when, this, when the state takes over, uh, will there be better parity for behavioral health services? So for example, right now, um, through my, I mean, I work for drug and alcohol, um, and through our insurance policy, going to see a mental health counselor um, is regarded as a specialist. <laughs> So I can't, I don't get to pay the $25 that I would to see my PCP. I have mm -hmm. to pay the specialist rate, which is $50. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there any, uh, anything being looked at for, for that? Do, do you, you know, what's disappointing is do you know how many complaints we've received on parity this year? How many, just guess. Huh? One. One. So, and, and by the way, by no means am I saying that uh, my fear is folks aren't letting us know about the issues that exist. So the situation that you're naming, there very well could be a parity violation, but no one's telling us about it because they don't understand the parity. <laughs> you can, you can, I'll give you my card. Uh, we definitely want you to file a complaint with us. Now, uh, when you say you work for drug and alcohol, is that with the state PEBTF? No. Okay. Got you. Okay. So, you know, once again, now one thing that we did create, just so that you can take a look at it, is we have six videos on parity, okay? And in those six videos, we actually break it down by type of insurance that individuals have and where they should go if they believe that a red flag exists uh, for help. Uh, and that's at insurance.pa.gov forward slash parity. Uh, and you know, so be sure to check that out. I'll give you my card just in case you can't find who to reach out to. But parity is something that we are very focused on. Every one of our market conduct exams, we are focusing on uh, parity as part of the aspect. Because like I said, one complaint, you know, while I want to believe that everyone is doing exactly what they're supposed to do, one always makes me a little, the only thing that would make me more uncomfortable would be zero, you know, and <laughs> one doesn't make me, you know, so I think there are opportunities out there. So we are absolutely looking at parity. We are absolutely looking at compliance and we want to make sure that folks are, are doing what they're supposed to be doing. So file those complaints with us if you have them, okay? And there is a time limit on the complaints. Um, the insurers or whoever the complaint is being lodged against, there's a time limit that they have to reply to the Department of Insurance. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't just go on forever. Yeah. Um, they have to be responsive. Thank you. What do you identify as potential solutions to these challenges? Uh, I think one solution is making the healthcare discussion more about solutions versus political talking points. Uh, I think that you've kind of said those, and I, I think that's that's something that you know, really, should be the focus is helping people, versus whatever is happening where folks can't seem to get along. Um, having real discussions about the real cost drivers of health care, you know, more transparency when it comes to health care. Uh, understanding how we can improve communication when it comes to health care. Um, people taking advantage of preventive services. Right. You know, actually going to the doctor before you are uh, really, really sick. You know, catching it sooner versus later. I think that is a solution. Uh, because, you know, health care costs are tied directly to rates and what you pay for insurance. So, you know, taking that approach of preventive, get you know, talking more about solutions, talking about costs, understanding what is driving these costs, and you, 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 know, you talked about that a lot uh, earlier. You know, I think those are, are solutions to the issue. 
I agree <laughs> completely. As far as the cost problem, the fact that health care insurance or health insurance keeps becoming more and more expensive. I mean, I don't know if I was entirely clear about this. I mean, where does the money get saved? Or I guess you could put it in one of two ways. Why do we, as a nation, spend, spend way more than any other country? Or you could just say, why do costs keep going up and up and up? Uh, and what advantages would you get under a single payer system? Again, one of the big reasons, it's not the only reason, but one of the biggest reasons that health care in the United States is so expensive is because of the administrative costs. I mean, all the complexities that we're talking about involve different layers of administrative work, negotiating bills, different kinds of paperwork. 25% uh, of hospital spending goes towards administrative costs. 30% of what every single American spends on health care goes towards paperwork and billing. 30% of what you pay for your health care goes towards administrative costs. All of that would be streamlined under a single payer system. Right now, administrative costs are high because, again, we have 6,000 different insurance companies in the U.S., all with their different plans, all with their very intricacies of the, within those plans. So you have to negotiate, insurers have to negotiate with providers. That's 6,000 different payers negotiating with different providers over these different costs. That's an administrative nightmare. If you have one payer, that nightmare goes away. And you also have the single payer, you have the power of, say, the state government or even better, the federal government to then negotiate with providers, hospitals, with pharmaceutical companies to say, you know what, you can't just arbitrarily jack up the prices anymore. The um, Pennsylvania on the marketplace has seven insurance carriers. Um, here in Crawford County, there are two. It's Highmark and UPMC. Um, our goal would, of course, be having more, uh, like the other 14 counties that increased. Um, the, you brought up a very good point when it comes to the 6,000 and, and negotiating the uh, different uh, networks and provider networks. The, the challenge that you have, because I know a lot of times I've heard things like, open the borders. It'll fix a lot of things. But the challenge that you run into that, if you had a California insurance company, well, they would have to negotiate with the Pennsylvania provider to actually do that network. And that can happen, but it's not. So, you know, it's not quite as, uh, not quite as, you know, where everybody's negotiating with everybody to get that. Unfortunately, like I said, here in Crawford County, there are two providers. In Philadelphia area, there are now three. Recently, as of like two years ago, there was one. Um, so, you know, it, it, there is a little bit more of a, of a nuance to it. And then also with the Affordable Care Act plans, a lot, those plans have to follow, follow like a medical loss ratio where 80 percent of uh, the premium dollars have to go towards the cost of health care. Um, other plans out there right now, they're short-term limited duration plans, they don't have those same by law uh, loss ratios. Now that, that gets a little bit more questionable, especially when some of the other plans that are available out there right now, the short-term plans uh, may not cover pre-existing conditions, may set a small limit on, you know, maybe they'll only pay $500 for an emergency room visit versus what it would be. So, you know, as you are shopping around, you do have to be careful of that, but there is by law a medical loss ratio on what has to be spent. So a, a portion of the challenge that you have with insurance costs is healthcare costs and, and just trying to understand what that balance is and how you get it under control. Uh, and, you know, and like I said, like you were saying earlier, I understand what you're saying in regards to like single payer system where all the doctors would have to I accept this is what we're going to pay, where today those doctors and insurance companies negotiate those things, and if the doctors don't want to accept that, they decide not to be on the network. We're in the world that you're talking about. No, everybody's in it together. Every hospital's in it together. Yeah, and this is, this is why, I mean, sometimes you hear about the public option. I mean, public option is not the same thing as single payer. Public option means you have a public option like single payer, but technically not single payer. But you also have private insurance. You still have a private insurance market. And this is precisely the problem with a public option, is 
I mean, the situation that David's just described is if you got a doctor who says, no, we're not going to pay what the single payer wants us to pay, we're going to go with the private insurance network. If you get rid of private insurance, the doctors have no choice, right? They have to, again, the whole point of a single payer system is to give people through the, through the single payer uh, leverage over the drug companies, over the hospitals, right? Not necessarily over individual doctors, but over those other entities, the drug companies, the hospitals, that right now can basically tell the insurance companies, you know, you know we're, not gonna, we're not gonna pay that. We're gonna pay, we want you to pay this. Thank you. Our last question, to a certain degree, has been answered uh, during our discussion, but perhaps we could just recap. So where should consumers go locally if they do not understand PA insurance options? And the second part of that question would be, what systems are in place to assist those consumers to apply and understand the different plans? So, <laughs> folks would want to contact a navigator or certified application counselor at one of Pennsylvania's 48 um, federally qualified health centers. The phone number is 1-888, I'm sorry, 1-866-944-CARE. Um, they will then reach our office and we'll be able to direct folks directly to a navigator. Uh, who will be able to meet with them in person or talk to them over the phone, um, give them options, um, tell them where they can go to sit down uh, to meet with folks, because sometimes folks don't like to enroll or talk about things over the telephone. They want to sit down with some fa someone face-to-face. -face. Um, Lisa Cox is here from Meville, and she is all over this area <laughs> and services as a navigator. Um, so you can definitely get her information before you leave tonight. Um, but again, folks can go to our website, which is pac.org, P-A-C-H-C dot org, or dial one eight six six nine four four care The um, all navigators or as the state of Pennsylvania calls them, exchange assisters, are registered within the state, so they have to take training through the federal government, which will eventually transition. Mm -hmm. uh, then they have to go through FBI fingerprinting, uh, and then they have to go through the registration process with the state. You can also get assistance with local agents. There are local agents in the area that offer assistance when it comes to signing up for health insurance. Uh, and then also the insurance department has created a page that has a couple of tools available. Uh, one is something called Consumer's Checkbook. Consumer's Checkbook is a price comparison tool that allows you to price different plans that are available in your area, including the potential subsidy that is available. Uh, it also has a local help, which will help you find that local agent or navigator. Uh, and it also has our education material when it comes to our videos and health insurance information. Like I said, the, the videos that we created talk about co-pays, deductibles, co -insurance. It explains what they are, how they work, what premium is, how to use your health insurance, what's an insurance card, what's a formulary. Uh, so, and those videos are about a minute and 30. The longest one is two minutes, and we could not get that one any lower. That one's about um, HMOs and, and EPOs. Um, if, you know, there are a couple of ways that you can find our information. Uh, as I mentioned, insurance.pa.gov. To find that one page that I was talking about, it'd be insurance.pa.gov and a forward slash, the number four, health, I-N-S, all one word. And then you can always call us if you're lost, and that's 1-877-881-6388. Uh, and then I'll give you all, I think I have enough business cards for everybody, I'll also give you my business card and you can all reach out to me if, if you're lost or need help and I'm happy to help direct you to the right places to go. Yeah, as far as uh, Healthcare for All PA, the organization that I'm here representing, I mean, we've got a great website where you can find out, you can get a ton of resources. We've done economic studies. Uh, you can get more details. There's a great frequently asked question page. Um, but in general, I'd say as, you know, we get, deeper and deeper into election season. And depending on how things play out, I think Medicare for All will continue to be at the forefront. It'll continue to be a topic of discussion. I mean, my biggest piece of advice, just as far as understanding what that is and what it entails, I'll kind of channel Gloria here. Gloria's in the front, and she's also on the board of Healthcare for All PA. Gloria's always saying, read the bill. 
I won't necessarily, and you can read the, you can get the health, the state level bill on the Healthcare for All PA website, but I at least say go to the source. I imagine as the, as the political season plays out, you're gonna hear a lot of really bad things about how bad Bernie is, about how bad Medicare for All would be. And I would just ask that you actually go to the source. I mean, Bernie's got a really nice website where you can explain it, and he's actually proposed a bill in the Senate, and you can get information there. But if you just actually look at the source and where this information is coming from, I mean, I think that would be a great way to kind of cut through all the, all the noise. <clears throat> If you don't mind, I'd like to trans, uh, transition from that a facil facilitator to a consumer, sure. and I'd like to direct my question to Joe. How can a consumer influence um, that state bill um, to move forward? Well, one thing you can do at the individual level is you could call your state reps, right? So your, your senator, I, I think we all have Michelle Brooks, at least if you're in Crawford County. Uh, and then depending on where you're at in Crawford County, you either have Brad Rowe as your representative or in the House, or you have uh, Kathy Rapp. So that would be one thing to do, is just to contact your state reps uh, and your state senator. Um, but more generally, I think, I mean, we're always looking for volunteers. Our organization is looking for volunteers. I don't think something like single payer is not gonna happen on an individual, like if we all kind of do our individual thing. I think it's gonna be, have to be something where we do come together and you're not always going to get everybody involved, especially people who have a stake in the status quo, but nothing is going to change unless you have numbers. And so part of it would be about getting together and building numbers. I'm happy to talk about that, if, if, and I can give you my contact information as far as how to do that at the county level, um, but this is also something that, like I said, this is, this is a straightforward political issue. So it's, it's about supporting candidates as well who kind of share this, these kinds of commitments. Uh, right now, our current legislators don't, most of them, um, including our state senators, too. I forgot to, I was going to mention who, the, who, you know, I asked you earlier, the top uh, industries, the lobbying industries. Any idea who the top recipients of health care money, health care lobbying money are? Number one is Beto O'Rourke, at least in 2018. Number two is Bob Casey. So our own senator is number two when it comes to U.S. politicians at the federal level who receive money from pharmaceutical and healthcare companies. So it's about getting the right people in office as much as anything else if something like this is gonna happen. Well, our thanks for our panel and our thanks to the folks who were here tonight. And I don't know about everybody else, but it is wonderful to come to a place and, and have a discussion without it being mean and nasty and ugly and people just express their views in a respectful manner. So um, can we just have a round of applause for our panelists? Thank you. <laughs> so it's always been. But thank you very much. And um, please see our panelists if yep. you have additional questions and, um, and visit the tables on your way out tonight. Thank you so very much.